Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five tour. I am your host, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, Kevin Adkison. And today I wanted to chat with everyone about some of the works of Carl Millis, the great Swedish-American sculptor who was in residence here at Cranbrook from 1931 until 1951. Now, if you watched our last Live at Five, which was two weeks ago, uh, you know that I talked about Carl Millis's works along uh, Academy Way. Today, I wanted to take a slightly different angle and talk about some of his works around the art museum and around the fountains. And you might hear why I would be interested in the fountains on today uh, for Live at Five. Now, the whole reason that we're having a bit of a Swedish obsession, and particularly a Carl Millis obsession, is that on May 22nd, less than a month away, the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research is going to have its annual fundraiser. And this year, our house party is called a Global House Party at Cranbrook and Millis Garden because we are doing it in association with our friends in Sweden at the National Museum of Carl Millis's Millis Garden. Uh, it was where he and Olga uh, moved in the 19 teens and where he passed away in 1955. And the fundraiser on May 22nd, you can get tickets right now at either some of the higher patron levels or if you just want to watch the movie that I am writing and producing, uh, those tickets are just $50 for an individual, $75 for a couple. And so it is going to be as fun and as exciting as a Live at Five, but with even more glamour and detail. So I really encourage everyone to head over to center.cranbrook.edu and purchase your tickets to our global house party at Cranbrook and Millis Garden. With that out of the way, let's get started with our weekly tour. And behind me, you see that there is uh, some scaffolding surrounding uh, the Folk Fedbitter. Uh, and this is a sculpture by Carl Millis that he made for a town in Sweden uh, after the celebrated uh, uh, prize-winning novel of the Tales of the Folkund. Uh, and so the Folk Fylbitter, uh, I don't really know, I'm not a Swedish speaker, uh, is the tale of a battle between heathens and Christians and monks stole this gentleman's grandson who would have been the leader of his clan and he spent 25 years searching for his grandson. Uh, this is towards the end of his life and you can see the sort of agony in his face. Now, the podium that the uh, uh, Philbiter is sitting on is designed by Aliel Saarinen, and right now it's wrapped in scaffolding because one of the things that we have to do every spring is to clean all of our uh, bronzes on campus. Most of our bronzes are Carl Millis, and so right now Giorgio uh, and his team at Venus Bronze Work are busy uh, uh, washing and cleaning and waxing all of these bronzes. Now, if you've seen enough Live at Fives, I have talked about these sculptures before, but one detail that you might not have noticed on your first visit to Cranbrook is that the little sculpture over here is also the Folke Filbiter. Uh, and so this is that same uh, figure at a much smaller scale. So Carl Millis worked at small scales and then would enlarge the sculptures. Now, Millis himself didn't actually do that. He had huge teams of people, including a team here at Cranbrook, who would work from uh, a plaster or clay model that Millis had made and then enlarge it to the full size. So this is, you can tell, here is our grandfather looking for his grandson. And then pay attention also to this horse head. They're forging a stream somewhere in medieval Sweden uh, here. And so you have in this camera view two depictions of the folk filbiter. But we didn't join just to talk about our favorite Swedish myths. We wanted to do Live at Five today to celebrate the glorious return of water. And so uh, as you can see the fountains after close to a year and a half, 
without any water have been filled and are gloriously spraying again. Now, Carl Millis loved water. He thought that water was what animated uh, sculpture and that it really was a requirement for any sort of major public or private space. For Millis, there really wasn't fountains or there really weren't sculptures without water. And what's interesting is I've been preparing for a global house party at Cranbrook and reading a lot of the archival materials about Millis as he was working on sculptures out of his Cranbrook studio was in the case of sculptures where water isn't a natural part. Uh, he would really go to great lengths to justify why, for instance, in Harrisburg, a sculpture of Benjamin Franklin needed to have water spraying behind it. Uh, and Millis is writing to the governor's assistants and sort of convincing the people of Harrisburg that, oh, Benjamin Franklin, he's not going to be getting sprayed with water. The water is the lifeblood of the spirit of Pennsylvania surrounding Ben Franklin, but we'll make sure he's not wet. Here at Cranbrook, he didn't have to do those types of justifications, in part because most of his sculptures here are aquatic in nature. Uh, but uh, as someone who lives on campus and who has been doing these tours uh, virtually and now in person some, it is so refreshing to again have the water and the fountains turned on here at Cranbrook. So if you're local, come out, take a walk around, enjoy the grounds and gardens. If you are further afield and you want to plan your trip to Cranbrook, I can also say that the museum is open, the Science Institute is opening, and on Saturday we start tours of Sarden House and Smith House. So there's a lot of reasons, in addition to the glorious return of water, to come to Cranbrook and explore. Now, I don't want to take time on today's Live at Five to talk about the figures of the Orpheus Fountain, so you can scroll back to March 2020 where I did do a detailed dive into the figures of the Orpheus Fountain and why we do not have the god of Orpheus standing in the middle as it is in the Swedish version. But this uh, uh, fountain group was sculpted in 1936 at Cranbrook for S Stockholm, uh, and then the Cranbrook version was installed in 1938. Now, I mentioned the Folk uh, Filbiter's horse, uh, and here we see the full-size version of the horse head from that same fountain uh, in Sweden. Uh, and Millis would often do this as a way of bringing income to his family and to his studio. Uh, he would create cast and parts of his sculptures. And so for Millis, this isn't, uh, it's not quite like we took, you know, uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night and cut it into pieces and sold them off. For Millis, he was really sort of uh, uh, thinking of his sculptures as both full-size uh, sort of civic sculptures, which would be the complete horse with the folk filbiter, and then also almost like Roman fragments. And so he would artistically arrange sections of his sculptures, give them new bases, this very beautiful sharp line across the neck, and then turn it into uh, a, a whole nother work of art for sale for collections. Now, there's water in the Orpheus Fountain, which means that there is water in the Triton Pools. And in the case of the Triton Pools, I think perhaps we could thank Cranbrook Facilities and the team at Venus Bronze Work for cleaning it all, uh, but we might want to be a little bit more spiritual and thank the Tritons themselves because it is through the Tritons who are down here, we'll walk closer to them, uh, the Tritons can use their conch shells to help control the weather. Now, normally they're doing this over on the Mediterranean and a few thousand years ago, uh, but according to uh, Greek and Roman legends, these man, uh, male torsos and heads with dolphin bodies control the weather uh, through their conch shells, and then they also escort uh, travelers around. And so in um, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, you see the Tritons as these sort of guardians. So I like to think that the Tritons uh, out here when no one was looking blew their conch shells and had the water return to the Triton pools. If we were looking at this circa 1940, um, uh, these, again, were installed about 1938. Uh, 
in those 38 1940s, we would not have had the museum. It was built after the pools on either side. And there also would have been lily pad gardens. There would have been formal flower arrangements sort of blooming all around the fountains. And the fountains would have had about 10 times as much power. So in old historic photographs, the water coming out of the Tritons is really just soaring back, which is how Millis actually preferred the fountains to look. He wanted really just powerful jets of water. Uh, you know, the longer I'm at Cranbrook, the more power I achieve, the more power we'll have with these fountains. So wish me luck, everyone, getting these things back, looking more whimsical and a little crazy. In addition to the tritons with their sort of super buff bodies, there are also these fish that are spraying water, and then of course the bull in Europa. And this arrangement was not designed by Carl Millis to have the tritons, the fishes, and the bull in Europa. These were all commissions for different sites in Sweden that were then done in this arrangement through the partnership of Eliel Saarinen, George Booth, and Carl Millis. And in the end, it makes the Tritons, who are known for escorting people across the Mediterranean, they now appear to be escorting the bull and Europa uh, across the Mediterranean to Crete. And of course, the wonderful steps of a pathway that I cannot promote as a pathway for liability purposes, but it was designed as a sidewalk uh, on which we could walk across as the water comes pouring through. One of my favorite of Eliel Saarinen's landscape details. Now, we've talked about the bull in Europa in other Live at Five, so I don't want to focus on uh, our Phoenician princess and Zeus today. Uh, but it is the story of Zeus falling in love with the human Europa, turning himself into an all-white bull as part of Europa's father's herd. Uh, Europa becomes infatuated with the white bull, and she ends up mounting Zeus, who then runs off with Europa across the Mediterranean to Crete, where he reveals himself as the god. And so here is that iconic Cranbrook image. Now, based on what I promised you all with our Facebook post, I said that we would be talking about Millis's garden and courtyard. And part of getting Millis to Cranbrook, uh, and we can see some academy students out here working and doing yoga, uh, was that George Booth promised Millis that he would have his own home and his own studios. And so this is Millis' house, which we toured a while ago on Live at Five. This is his home studio coming out. Then he had a small studio running here, the current head of the sculpture department studio. And then this uh, orange windowed building was not here in Millis's time. That's from about 1966. But if you see the copper roof running back across, that is Millis's large studio. And he had a courtyard in between his small studio, large studio, and then the student studio, which runs here. And the Orpheus Fountain was actually sculpted and displayed first in the site of the Orange Foundry. So that was his exterior courtyard where he could show off his grand civic projects. Now, I have unlocked the gate into Millis House Garden, so we will uh, head up there next while we all look at these healthy, conscious students busy at work. Hello, Meryl. Hello, Daniel, Ed. Now, the landscape here is, like much at Cranbrook, in need of a refresh. So in Millis's era, uh, you did not come down these steps into a forsythia path, uh, but nature finds a way. And this is the pathway up to Academy Way where the other faculty housing would be. We're not gonna go inside Millis' house today, but we can see some of his studios, which have walls of all glass on the northern exposure so that he gets that even northern light into the studio. Now, he would have in his own day looked across very manicured uh, gardens with much smaller trees, of course, and so he could have seen the pools and fountains uh, from his little pathway. Now, there are two gates back here, and we see yet more students happily waiting. Thanks for letting me uh, distract you. Oh, no, this is 
staff. Um, and so our first gate is CM for Carl Millis. And this is the entrance into what was Millis's own courtyard. So remember, this building wasn't here. Uh, this had a glass window overlooking the fountains. And then CM Carl Millis there on the iron gate. Now on the gate, which I unlocked earlier into a very private garden, so don't uh, try this at home, everyone. We see O.M. for Olga Millis, and Olga was the Austrian-American uh, wife of Carl Millis, who lived here uh, from 1931 to 1951 as well. Now, we will work our way through this gate, and this is now the home of Cranbrook Academy of Arts director, and so this is where Susan Ewing and her uh, partner Paul live. And the next director, whoever that will be, will also have this residence. And so Carl Millis back here, it's a little bit, or not a little bit, but it's really sort of a major change from when he lived here because Carl Millis brought with him to Cranbrook, and you'll learn more about this in the documentary film once you go to center.cranbrook.edu and buy your ticket to a house party at Cranbrook. But he brought with him a collection of close to a hundred Greek and Roman sculptures. Further research has shown that some of those were not Greek and Roman uh, vintage, but he thought they were, so I'll say they were. Uh, and back here in the back garden, he did not display his own sculptures, though from time to time he would have uh, bronzes before they sold or shipped off. But instead, he actually displayed his Roman antiquities. And so he was famous for these tea parties where, about where I am standing, he had a large, very large Roman bathtub and uh, a table as well. And he would sort of serve these wonderful teas and things from the back garden. Now, the only part of Millis's uh, legacy that, that was not taken back to Sweden, because you may remember that Aliel Sarnen died on campus in an active role at Cranbrook. George Booth died at Cranbrook, Allen as well. Uh, but Carl Millis actually left Cranbrook and, and had about a four and a half year career before his own passing. And so Millis took everything with him. Uh, but one thing he left was the sculpture or the fountain there, which had originally a Roman basin uh, beneath it that has, was at some point replaced with this uh, uh, iridescent glazed shell sculpture. I'm not quite sure when this was done. There are other elements though of Millis's past. So he displayed sculptures on columns. That was his uh, favored way of displaying sculptures. You can see our peonies popping up uh, now. And then all, imagine this courtyard being just absolutely chock-a-block full of Greek and Roman antiquities sitting out in the garden. There are also these wonderful columns which have this very gentle intasis or tapering uh, up towards the wooden trellis, which in Millis's day, the Sarnen design trellis was a substantially more elaborate than the one that was uh, rebuilt here probably in the 1990s. And then, of course, it looks into Millis's uh, living room, his dining room, uh, and that is still where Susan and Paul entertain as uh, the leaders of Cranbrook today. So it is, I admit, not quite as glorious to be here in Millis's garden uh, in April 2021 as it would have been in April 1941, uh, but... As a consolation prize, uh, on May 22nd, 2021, through the magic of cinema and the magic of Cranbrook archives, as well as all new drone photography, um, all new videography, um, we are really putting together a pretty spectacular film. It's going to incorporate Swedish music performed by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Uh, it will incorporate uh, guest appearances, including from Her Excellency, the Swedish Ambassador to the United States, who will be interviewed by uh, longtime Cranbrook supporter Tom Marks. It's really going to be an elaborate project, and if it doesn't kill your dear curator to put it all together, uh, it is going to be a really wonderful experience to share with all of you. So I do encourage you, it's the last week to purchase 
uh, tickets at the patron level. So if you want to enjoy a Swedish smorgasbord and Swedish themed dinner with wine pairing, as well as a really lovely gift basket, uh, some original photography from Jim Hafner, uh, those are all items that are available with the Cranbrook uh, Global House Party at Cranbrook and Millis Garden patron package. Uh, but if you just want to log on on the evening of May 26th and watch the new Millis film and participate in our silent auction as well as a small live auction, uh, those tickets are just $50 or $75. So head over to center.cranbrook.edu. Uh, the way that the center continues to exist and function is through your support. And so um, if Live at Five sounds like a pledge drive for PBS between now and May 22nd, it's because just like PBS and NPR, we survive on viewers like you. So head over. Uh, it will really mean a lot to uh, see you all at the fundraiser on May 22nd. So I hope that you come out. I know it will be worth your time and treasure uh, as we celebrate the legacy of Carl Millis, Olga Millis, and the many Cranbrook uh, Swedish connections. I neglected to mention uh, that the movie also features a brand new film uh, about Millis Garden. It is produced by a Swedish filmmaker and our friends in Stockholm, uh, but it's going to be part of the hour, hour and a half long evening. So you'll spend uh, uh, half an hour or so exploring the legacy of Carl and Olga Millis here at Cranbrook and in America. And then we'll spend 10 or 15 minutes exploring Millis Garden with all new videography, drone footage, and historic uh, photographs of his Swedish home and compound. So if you've never been to Stockholm, you've never been to Millis Garden, this is your chance to really get a super high resolution, super beautiful uh, virtual tour. Much better resolution than watching it on your phone like Live at Five. It is really going to be a spectacular treat to explore Cranbrook and Millis Garden in this brand new way. Head on over to center.cranbrook.edu to buy your tickets right now. Don't wait. You can even shut off Live at Five because it's almost over anyways. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Come to Cranbrook, explore the fountains. It is uh, beautiful spring weather as we watch the cascades of the Triton pools as they descend down to the lower gardens. Until next Wednesday, where we will have a another uh, uh, Swedish-themed Live at Five, I'm Kevin Atkinson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, and I will see you then.